Welcome to worship this day in the Lord's house. Welcome to all of you who are here today in person and those of you who are home online joining us via Facebook or later on our YouTube page. It is a pleasure to be together in spirit and truth today as we draw closer and closer to celebrating the birth of Jesus. I'd like to direct your attention to a few of our announcements today. We have a couple of things we'd like to share with the church. We will be having our traditional family Christmas celebration on Christmas Eve this year. That will be at 6.30 on the 24th. And pending, um, pending enough volunteers in the tech center that will be live streamed for those of you who might not be able to join us in person that day, we really do hope that um, you know, we can share that over the airwaves and here in person. Now, we wanted to remind folks one more time here about the weekly home touch mailing. This is a mailing that the church sends out to a lot of our shut-ins or folks who might not be able to get out as much as they used to. And it keeps them up on church news and lets them know they're not forgotten and that they're still very, very much close to our hearts. Each week they receive a bulletin and you know, a letter with a little devotional in it and some, uh, some puzzles and activities and things that, that uh, help pass the time. Um, we'd also, as we come into this month of giving, we ask the diaconate is prayerfully considering the donation to the Retired Ministers and Missionaries Fund. Um, we know so many people who have given their lives over to service, not only in the preaching of the word and ministering to God's people, but also as missionaries, both at home and abroad. This doesn't always offer the most expansive opportunities in retirement. So we do ask that you consider maybe helping those folks out who have given so much of themselves to serve God's people. Um, We'd like to remind folks, as many of you here today are in your Christmas best, that we do have the photo booth backdrop set up down in the fellowship hall. If you'd like to grab a quick family picture on the way out today, um, please do so. And we'll leave that up through Christmas Eve if you wanted to get a picture this coming Friday. Um, the trustees do have a, a reminder here that um, as we come into the end of the year and budget finalizations are being, being done, it really helps to have that uh, giving commitment. You'll find that there's one in your bulletin insert this week. Would you ask that you please really consider including your giving plan in that to really help the trustees um, plan accordingly so that we can be good stewards of the gifts that you give us. And speaking of which, I'd like to invite Claudia up this morning for a word from the trustees concerning the end of the year. Good morning. On behalf of the trustees, is that better? Yep, thank you. On behalf of the trustees, I want to thank all of you for your support. This has been a tough year, as you all know, with numerous challenges. COVID has created a world in which we, many, we must consider many effects, including attending church. We have been blessed with many who continue to give and support their church and their ministries. Sadly, some have not been able to continue their giving or have had to reduce it. We've also lost some people, some family, which really saddens us, but we continue to remember them in our work and ministries. Uh, we will be presenting the budget for 2022 next week on December 26, next Sunday. You are welcome to ask questions during that gathering after church or contact any of the trustees with your questions and concerns. As we move into 2022, we will be searching for an interim pastor and a called pastor. Not knowing what kind of financial package we can offer may limit our choices. Financial commitment statements are in today's bulletin the newsletter, and available in the court. And if you still don't have one, call the office and we'll make sure that you get one. We encourage you to help build a financial profile that can offer a reasonable rage, wage that will bring highly qualified candidates. Of course, we know that God will have a hand in this, but he also gave us the ability to act responsibly. Giving is currently down and fairly inconsistent. We pray that you will all prayerfully consider your giving. Just imagine going to the store to buy groceries for a month with no idea 
of how much money you have in your pocket when you get to the register. It's a very unsettling thought. In Corinthians we read, for if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. Thank you for your time and your consideration. May you all have a safe and glorious Christmas. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia, for <clears throat> reminding us of just how important it is to be as prepared as we can to going into the next year as we begin some very important searches to fulfill those roles of interim pastor and permanent called pastor. And now I would invite you all to stand and join in song as we sing together our hymn, The First Noel, that is number 205 in your hymnals or on the screen behind me.
be seated. <clears throat> this being our fourth Sunday of the Advent anticipation, we look forward this morning to bringing forth the final Advent candle, the candle of joy. And the Comstock family will be coming down today to do so. I'd invite you guys to go ahead and, and bring down our candle today. People walking in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of deep darkness. A light has dawned. You have en enlarged the nation of increased their joy. They rejoice before you have people rejoice at the harvest as war warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder for as in the day of midian's defeat you have shattered the yoke that burdens them the bar across their shoulders the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Thank you. And I would like to invite our young people to join Miss Debbie for a few moments. As we prepare now to come to a time of prayer, to come to a time of prayer, we'd like to bring forward the prayers of our congregation and our community and our church. I'd like to highlight a few prayer requests in our bulletin today. Um, we continue to pray for Dean to pray for Dean Burrows as he recovers from an injury, and Nettie White as she recovers from illness. We lift uh, Dennis Schaefer, Gary's brother, in prayer. We continue to pray for Mel Hayward in her recovery, and Lindsay Scott in her grief. We lift up the Maluski family. We pray for Audrey Rung and Ted Boyer continue to pray for Sheila and so many people. We, uh, we'd like to ask for prayer for the family of Corey Neiman, a relative of Phillips, 
who has tragically passed away after a battle with Alzheimer's. We do ask that God's grace and peace be over them as they grieve. Let us now take these things and so much more to our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we, we come before you in anticipation of this next week and the celebration that will come on Christmas morning with the anticipation of waiting for the promises fulfilled and we look back to that time when our people, your people, our family, your family, as Israel awaited the fulfillment of those promises and their faith was rewarded just as we look back to the Christ child, his perfect life and his death and resurrection and what that gives to us. Let us, Lord, carry that hope out into the world. Let it be a solve to all of our grief, our pain, our hurt. We pray, Lord, for physical healing. We ask that you would mend sickness and brokenness and injury. We pray, Lord, for emotional strength. We pray for spiritual peace as we grieve as we face uncertainty. For some of us, this time of anticipation is less joyful and more somber. Let us remember that these times can carry very difficult memories for some of us and be willing and joyful companions to those who may not experience the Christmas season with as much joy as others. We pray, Lord, for our community, our schools, our governments. We ask that you would be over these things in a way that will bring thriving and flourishing not only to our neighbors, but to the greater the greater family of people, the greater human family. We ask, Lord, that you would be over all of these things in a way that would call people to your side and to your love and to your grace. We want to specifically pray today for our church. We know that a period of time in search can feel so anxious, can feel so uncertain. We know that not having all of the answers is unsettling. We know that your plan doesn't always follow a clean, prepared bullet list when it comes to doing ministry and living out your love and your commandments in this world. So as we continue to look for a shepherd who will carry us through our immediate future, we ask that you not only give us the strength and hope going through that, but we pray, Lord, that you would help us to be patient and understanding and prayerful. Draw us to our knees daily to pray for this family of faith, for the church and the work that it has done, and the amazing reputation and lives that we have touched in the past. May we look to those victories and those things and be so excited for the next 50 years of what we can do here in this church in your name. Help us, Lord, to come together in unity as we prepare for that time. Help us, Lord, to be kind and compassionate with each other. Help us to share in truth what our expectations and fears and joys really are about our relationship with this church and its people. Help us, Lord, to go forward in a way that expresses the unity of the Trinity. Help us, God, to really live our faith out, not only in doing kind things, but also in the way that we manage this church. All of life for the Christian is worship, 
remind us of that as we plan and pray. Let us enter now together into the prayer that your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, it is my pleasure to reintroduce Reverend Dave Huzanga. Close enough. <laughs> um, he will be leading us through our offering and the rest of our service today. Thank you.
if you would stand and sing something very familiar, but to a tune very appropriate to this season. Lord, in this season of the greatest offering ever given, may we offer not only gifts of finance, but also our very selves for the upbuilding of your kingdom. Even as we give loaves and fishes, you came in a manger for the sake of the whole world. In Christ's name, amen. We remain standing to sing. Uh, away in a manger, but again, with a couple tunes uh, a little different than we might expect. Before entering into the sublime God's word, let me say a very unsanctified thing, perhaps, as I am worshiping with you in the first portion of this service, one thing that, uh, that uh, occurs to me is, as I pulpit supply in the area in various churches, it's always a little bit of a, uh, a guessing game and then a remembering game, debts? trespasses or sins in this particular congregation. And uh, since I was here once before, this time my memory worked. And uh, indeed, forgive us our debts is, uh, is the version spoken here. Great to be with you again. Um, this is from the, from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 1 thir through 13. Hear the word of the Lord. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, 
where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those 40 days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, People do not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. The word of the Lord. Please pray with me. Holy Spirit, come and do what no speaker can and do what no listener can. Bear your word from a halting mouth and unstop the ears of your people that we would be transformed. Amen. Do you like the season of Advent? The secular world doesn't have much interest in it other than an an assortment of holiday calendars offering 25 days of cute surprises or or tasty treats or whatever, there's pretty much nothing about Advent that can help the bottom line. Ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here. It's not exactly a, a merchandiser's dream. Blessed Advent greetings doesn't pop up on my screen on Cyber Monday. But the purpose of this season is so vital to the Christian walk of faith. Advent is both countercultural and crucial. So this morning I'd like to look at how uh, Luke 4, 1 to 13, which we just read, the temptation of Christ, can aid us in this difficult task of of year-round Advent living. We'll touch super briefly on the second and third temptations, but really our time will be spent on the first. If you're honest with yourself, might one of your first thoughts when hearing these three temptations be, what's so hard about that? I mean, granted, keeping a New Year's resolution of the diet and all of that, you know, not eating for 40 days and all of that, I I get that part maybe. But I mean, this is the Son of God, for crying out loud. For most of us, especially for Jesus, how alluring could it be to to bow down to Satan or test an angel parachute or just pull some bread out of a hat? I mean, it's not like making bread, bowing down, jumping off a building. They don't rise to the level of things we wrestle with, do they? Lust, gossip, gossip anger, materialism, addictions, and on and on. Or does it? Consider the devil's opening salvo, verse 3. If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Let me take a a not-so-random detour for a moment here. How do you envision the little Jesus in the Christmas manger? Do you imagine him with this kind of divine consciousness, you know, slyly thinking, hmm, how early can I start talking without people thinking I'm a freak of nature? Hmm, this full diaper is really uncomfortable. Since I'm the Son of God, maybe I'll just snap my fingers to perform an instant miracle change. Hmm, 
Can't believe it'll be almost two millennia till they invent the onesie. Mm. No. <laughs> That's not what's going through little baby Jesus' head. Charles Wesley was on to something when he penned, And Can It Be, that great hymn, and he said of God's Son, He emptied himself of all but love. The humanity of Jesus of Nazareth is full and deep and complete. The boundaries of, of body and brain so uncompromised that Jesus' self-awareness of his divinity, that wasn't like some, you know, Mensa manger moment, if I were to get all poetic about it. It's a long-term process, undoubtedly. So make no mistake here, the devil's words were seductive sowing seeds of doubt in the mind of a mere carpenter's son from Nazareth. If you are the son of God, it's kind of a, a repackaged enticement from the serpent of Eden. Take and eat and be like God. Here in the wilderness, he is taunting the seed of Eve. If you are the Son of God, then prove it. Let's see a little magic. After all, you are hungry, aren't you? Question. Do you and I, do we require kind of the stones to bread fireworks show? Miracle answers to our prayers for us to actually believe in the identity and the power of Jesus? Do we demand an early Christmas rather than accepting a lengthy Advent? Or can we truthfully confess with the hymn writer, another one, I ask no dream no prophet ecstasies, no sudden rending of the veil of clay, no angel visitant, no opening skies, but take the dimness of my soul away. I think that stanza models magnificently the patient desperation of authentic Advent living. Advent living is rooted in the already accomplished miracles of Christmas and Easter. It's a lifestyle that it doesn't seek daily campground highs or endless signs on demand. It's a lifestyle that revels in what Christ has done and is supremely confident of what Christ will do. That mixture of gratitude and hope that's a potent combination, a potent mixture for the walk of faith. Even so, though, wouldn't kind of zapping stones to bread be a real shot in the arm? I mean, a, a pick-me-up that would make our Advent living more successful? I mean, wouldn't it be helpful in our moments of trial and temptation if God were to break into the deafening silence with a mighty supernatural trumpet blast? Hmm. Yeah, it would, I guess, at times. But hear these words of Oswald Chambers. Maybe you know his famous devotional, My Utmost for His Highest. Might not be quite the bestseller right now, but uh, over the last century it's been quite a, um, quite a frequent book on, on the shelf in the library of many Christians. Here's what he says, the encouragement he offers when the silence of God is what you face. And look how he, he turns it completely on its head. When you cannot hear God, you will find that he has trusted you in the most intimate way possible. With absolute silence, not a silence of despair, but one of pleasure. Because he saw that you could withstand an even bigger revelation. Have you ever thought of that? That God's silence is an affirmation of your faith. It's like Job's loyalty that God has confidence in, despite Satan's sneering. 
God may be declaring to you, the faith I have given you is sufficient. Let me prove it to you. Let me show you that by grace, you are strong enough to endure my silence and yet remain faithful. I, I think of this church's situation right now of waiting, waiting, a season searching for a pastor. Is that Advent living or what? Maybe rather than simply a loss or simply a challenge, it's the Lord's word to you. I trust your faith by grace in the seeming silence we are yet faithful. The favor of the Lord may be his silence. So fasting, uh, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. When God offers you silence or, or seeming absence in times of struggle, uh, when you are, we could say, forced to fast from ease, from visible blessings, God may be affirming rather than abandoning you. But there's another aspect to the experience of trials and, and tribulations here. While fasting may have made Christ vulnerable to the physical temptation of bread, I mean, you fast, you're hungry, yeah, the bread may be, be tempting. I think it, it simultaneously strengthened him for a much greater spiritual temptation to doubt his identity as the Son of God. I mean, isn't that the purpose of fasting? To devote more time and energy to intimacy with God, to grow spiritually, to exercise your faith muscles. It's kind of the, the, another great season in the church. It's kind of the point of, of giving something up for Lent, not to be a, a martyr, not a masochist, but to devote more time, more attention, more focus to things of faith. If temptation was essentially about eating, then Christ's foodless desert wandering was a tribulation that made temptation harder. But when we grasp that the real temptation was much deeper, we recognize that the Holy Spirit led Christ into the desert with gracious purpose. Jesus was given 40 days to fast not so that turning stone into bread was going to be some big temptation. He was given 40 days to fast in preparation for the devil's assault. The devil didn't stand a chance. Jesus preparing for 40 days to face temptation. Perhaps, likewise, this season of Advent living for you as a church community is the same. Preparing you for difficulty. Preparing you, though, for triumph over temptation and struggle. So ponder the wilderness fastings that we encounter in Advent living. Difficulties and trials, waiting, lacking, longing, enduring seeming silence from God at times. Those things tempt us to falter. Our instinct is to avoid any kind of unwelcome experiences at all costs. We might insist that instead we be served delicious desserts, circumstances and outcomes that, that fit our own perfect plans and timetables. Uh, bring us some figgy pudding and bring it right now. But if they are prayerfully embraced, the perils of Advent living just might become preparation for spiritual victory. So fasting prepared Jesus, but in the moment of temptation itself, how did he confront it? Verse 4, verse 8, verse 12, we see it clearly, his simple and powerful strategy. It is written. It is written, Scripture was his weapon. Scripture was his shield. Scripture was his sword. Try this for word association. Led into the wilderness for forty such and such, 
nothing to eat, hungry. Did the word Israelites or something similar come to mind? The Exodus, the escape from Egypt, and then wandering in the wilderness. The description of that sojourn is uh, recorded in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8. Let me read it. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble you and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. I mean, Jesus was a serious student of God's word. I realize that's kind of a, like, no duh, David thing. You know, Jesus knew the scriptures. But sometimes I just think it's enthralling to encounter Christ's wisdom and knowledge of the Word. Like, like the teachers at the temple when, when Jesus was only 12 years old, I am astounded. When he was led by God into the wilderness here, hungry for 40 days, longing for familiar food, he recognized precisely how his circumstance intersected with the experience found in the scripture of his people. His response to the devil, man does not live by bread alone, that's not an isolated sort of, oh, spiritual food is more important than physical. As true and important and as effective as that is, it is a conscious identification with that passage from Deuteronomy 8. Jesus is declaring to the devil, I refuse to pine for the leeks and onions of Egypt. If need be in this desert, Yahweh can feed me with manna from heaven. The precedent is enough. No presto shazam miracle needed, and certainly not at your request, Satan. My Father will provide. End of story. I think Jesus' example here challenges us to know the Word of God with such depth that we can apply it with wisdom and power to the trials of Advent living. I suppose sometimes God used the, uses the kind of let your Bible fall open and drop your finger onto a verse, and wow, that kind of creativity. <laughs> eh, sometimes maybe the Lord does use that. But what, that almost seems like a turn stone to bread sort of expectation of fireworks. The hard work of immersing ourselves in Scripture, in the wilderness, that's a survival technique we need to practice. Feeding on the Word. God prepares us to bring the Word of God then to bear on dire circumstances. Weary brothers and sisters, facing trials, past, present, future, do you intentionally search and speak the Scriptures? It is written should be your overarching mantra for Advent waiting and Advent living. Now, I don't claim to be able to read Jesus' mind, but I'm rather convinced this morning that in this moment of trial, there was another word of God's divine proclamation that was even more powerfully sustaining him. So January 26, 2014, on that day, uh, at Resurrection Community Church outside of Philadelphia, where I pastored for, for 12 years, I had the great privilege of baptizing the first of my children. And in preparation for that service, I was reading a passage from Luke chapter 3, just one prior to this, the one today that we're studying. And the passage moved me deeply. For one, it was written by Luke. Luke, the same name as my son, who would soon be standing in the baptismal pool. But much more significantly, what moved me so deeply was verses 21 and 22. Now when all the people were baptized, Jesus too was baptized. And while he was praying, the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. 
with you I am well pleased. It's a powerful verse if you're baptizing your son. But also, if, if that passage was, was meaningful to, to little old me as I prepared to baptize my eldest, just imagine what those words must have been like for Jesus. Here in chapter 4, I mean, mere paragraphs after the baptismal account, the devil scoffs, if you are the Son of God. But at that very moment, don't you think, had to be ringing in Jesus' ears the Father God's pronouncement to him just 40 days prior, you are my Son, whom I love. If trials prepare us for Advent living, and the Word of God is our tool for Advent living, then this biblical assurance is our truth for Advent living. You are a child of God, and He is well pleased with you. In the midst of waiting, longing, desperation of Advent living, hear the word of the Lord to you. You are his child, and you are well-pleasing to him. While we wait for our blessed hope, the return of Christ, let Abba Father's declaration of love for you demolish any of the devil's seeds of doubt. Let me just conclude with uh, a brief comment on, on the second and third temptations. The, the allure of the, the second temptation was for Jesus to avoid the cross, quite related to Advent living, uh, not just waiting, but wow, the tough things, I'd like to not face them. That was the allure, to avoid the cross, yet regain his throne. To, to, to regain his authority and power without, without cost. Bow down to me, and I'll give you the world. Skip the cross. Don't take the long route. Don't wait. Grab it now. Strike a bargain. I'll give you a good deal, an irresistible Black Friday sale. Just bow down. But Jesus refuses to accept a coronation without a cross. Jesus is no Esau hungry enough to sell his birthright. He holds on to his inheritance by rejecting the devil's offer. So with Scripture again, Jesus rebukes the tempter a second time. And in the third temptation, the devil tries to fight fire with fire. Twice foiled by the word of God, this time he attempts to steal, it is written, as a weapon against the author himself. If you truly are the Son of God, then you can't be harmed. Throw yourself down. Surely the Father wouldn't allow you to die. Let me give you Psalm 91 as my proof. But Jesus rejects the devil's abuse of God's word. One day, his Father would indeed let him die. And of course, at that time, he would again be taunted and tempted to jump down. Save yourself if you are the Son of God. Come down from the cross. But 10,000 angels weren't called to cushion his fall. Jesus did not come down from the cross and spare himself, but he did rise from the grave to spare us. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Please pray with me. Faithful Son, made like us in every way, yet without sin. Refine and prepare us through your mercies tender and severe. Immerse us in your word that we might be prepared to counter the wiles of the evil one. And assure us, as we wait, that we have been lovingly adopted by you, and you are well pleased. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
So, a little unusual to reverse the order, I, I believe. Haven't been here too often, but I think usually the children's sermon comes before the regular one. But at this point, I'd like to ask the kids to come down front. Hmm. Where are they? Huh. Something's a little different today. <laughs> My cadence at the end of the sermon probably didn't give enough warning to Bill. <laughs> Either that or I should have preached longer. What do you think about that one? <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> Phil, I don't know if you have an interlude in your fingertips, but we, oh, we're ready to begin. something so fast in my life. Much more than that. Let me grab the first edition of the night before 
Christmas and see if that will help you understand. Tonight's the night God is sending Jesus down to earth. I'm so excited. Who should we tell the news to first? Well, God knows best. Let's get the others, angels, and head out. Wait on Gabriel. The people in Bethlehem, a small rural town, were just getting ready to lay themselves down. I have so much to do. I have never seen so many people in town this past send us from the Romans and is really causing a lot of headache. My place is so full. I had to turn people away just a little while ago. The young couple begged me to let them stay in my stable. I let them. The wife is expecting a baby any time now. I suppose it is better than sleeping in the street. Maybe I should check on the, that couple. Now they'll be all right. And out on the hillside, while watching their sheep, a group of young shepherds were falling asleep when suddenly out of the sky came a light. An angel appeared, making everything bright. A baby is born, this, this night is his birth. He came to save all of the people on earth. In Bethlehem town, you will find this dear child with just Sophie and Mary, his mother, mother so mild. Sharing a manger with oxen and sheep, masculine blankets, this baby sound asleep. Good news we bring you this wonderful night. Jesus is born. Run 
to the site. so much and don't hurry out when we're done because I have something special for all of you. Thank you for helping us put together a surprise play on short notice in very interesting times. Go ahead and you guys go upstairs and get your costumes taken care of, okay?
For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him the Amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you.